Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Happy Friday. Thanks for tuning in tonight for our online Bible study. Let's get into it. I welcome you and thank you for being here this evening. If you are new to the study or new to the church, my name is Dave St. Aubin, and I'm the senior pastor here at Thoburn United Methodist Church in St. Clairsville, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you wherever you may be tuning in from this evening. Tonight, we are wrapping up our look, our study of the book of Genesis. We are looking at Genesis chapter 50, and so I invite you to grab your Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 50, grab something to take some notes with, maybe a snack or a beverage, and let's get into it. Well, again, welcome and thanks for joining tonight on this chilly Friday evening. I pray that you are staying uh, healthy and warm wherever you may be, whether you're joining live right now or later on this weekend or later on this month, whenever that may be. It's been a pleasure to go with uh, go with you on this journey through Genesis over the last 10 weeks. Hard to believe that we've been in this study for 10 weeks now. We've been looking at a chapter a night each weeknight for the last 10 weeks. And so here we are wrapping up this book. And uh, so um, I appreciate you uh, being um, dedicated to the study for taking time to go through these uh, chapters together. And I pray that it's been a help as we've gone through the, this book that has helped you discover things in a new light and in a new way. Uh, last night, if you recall, we looked at Genesis chapter 49 and Jacob's blessing on his sons, the 12 sons of Jacob, which would eventually lead into the 12 tribes of Israel. Tonight, we're going to look at Joseph's death. And so if you don't have your Bible, I've put the uh, verses up here on the screen for you. And we'll go through this tonight and talk about what it means. So open to Genesis 50 and uh, let's get into it. So uh, Jacob, if you recall last night, uh, we had mentioned he was 147 when he had died. And so now Joseph, uh, after him passing, Joseph throws himself on his father and weeps over him and kissed him. And then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. Apparently Joseph had asked the uh, physicians in the court to mummify his body. So the physicians embalmed him and uh, they took a full 40 days for that was the time required for the embalming. And then it says that the Egyptians mourned for 70 days. Now the Egyptians, uh, normally at the passing of a pharaoh, the death of a pharaoh, they would mourn for 72 days. So this was just two days shy of uh, that kind of honoring what they would have done for a pharaoh. They they. The Egyptians mourned for 70 days over the passing of Jacob. It's a sign of respect and, and uh, recognition of who he was. So when the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, if I, had found, if I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me and tell him my father made me swear, on, uh, swear an oath and said, I am about to die, so bury me in the tomb that I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. And so now let me go up and bury my father, and then I will return. Now we looked at that a couple chapters ago when Jacob said, when I die, I want to be buried in Canaan. I don't want to be buried in Egypt. And, and so Pharaoh says to, uh, to Joseph, uh, go Go and bury your father just as he made you swear to do, just as you agree that you would do. And so Joseph went up to Canaan to bury his father. All of Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court, all the dignitaries of Egypt. 
besides the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household, only the children and the flocks were left behind in Goshen. And chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. And when they reached the, fleshing, uh, the threshing floor at Atad, near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly. And there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. This elaborate funeral of Jacob was most likely due to um, <clears throat> the, the high regard that the Egyptians held him uh, as Joseph's father. And uh, to the Egyptians, um, you know, just the, a way of honoring who he was. So this was quite a procession traveling up to Canaan. And uh, it was something that the Egyptians also enjoyed doing. They loved kind of these showy uh, funeral ceremonies. So in verses 7 through 10, we see this. that This is the grandest state funeral recorded in the Bible. And it's entirely appropriate uh, because Jacob's story spans uh, half, more than half, of the book of, of Genesis. So when the Canaanites who lived there saw all this uh, mourning taking place, when they saw this grand procession, this state funeral uh, at Atad, they said the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. They thought it was the Egyptians. Uh, that were having this service, not the Israelites, not Jacob's family. And so they named the place near the Jordan Abel Mizraim, which means uh, the meadow of uh, mourning, not mourning time, but like grief, mourning, the, the meadow of the mourning of Egypt. The Canaanites apparently were so impressed with, with what was taking place in this grand party of mourners that they named the place for them. Quite a procession traveling up from Egypt to Canaan for the burial of Jacob. And so Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan. They buried him in the uh, the cave of the field of Machpelah near Maram, which Abraham had purchased. We looked at that yesterday and, and in previous chapters. Uh, along with that field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. That was several chapters ago that we saw this purchase of land. So they buried Jacob there. After burying him, they uh, returned to Egypt. Joseph and all the officials, the dignitaries, the family, uh, the brothers, everybody who had gone, they make their way back to Egypt. This, this grand procession out of Egypt... Uh, it, it kind of foreshadows Israel's exodus out of Egypt, which we will see uh, when we get into the book of Exodus. But it also gives a foretaste of the time when the nations hail uh, a descendant of Jacob as a king. And, and the record of Jacob's burial here uh, in this land is important to the purposes of Genesis. God had promised this land to Abraham. And he had already given, uh, given the patriarchs small portions of the promised land. And, and the, the faith of these men, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that God would fulfill his promises and, and do for their descendants all that he had promised them, uh, their faith is very obvious here. They, they viewed Canaan as their land, their homeland. And they were counting on future faithfulness of God to their descendants, that God had proved himself to be faithful time and time again uh, to them personally, and, and so they were establishing this land knowing that God would be faithful to their descendants as well. So now in chapter 50, we get to verse 15, and we finally see this peace in the family of Jacob. So when Joseph's brothers saw that their father had died, they said, what's going to happen now if Joseph holds this grudge against us and pays us back for everything wrong that we did to him? Remember, they, they, they threw him in a cistern. They were going to kill him. They sold him off into slavery. He had already made amends with them, but now they're worried. Father's gone. 
what's going to happen now if Joseph suddenly uh, plots his revenge against us? So the brothers send word to Joseph, and, and they tell him, you know, Dad left these instructions before he died, right? Your father left these instructions, and this is what you are to say to Joseph that I, I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. So they're, they're kind of covering themselves here. They're, they're, you know, they're worried Joseph's going to retaliate. He's still second in command in Egypt. So they send this note, right? And this is what dad said. You have to forgive us. But when Joseph got that message, he, he cried. Uh, Jacob's death here raised such fears in the heart hearts of Joseph's brothers that they had claimed Jacob left a message for Joseph urging him to forgive them. Now, it's not possible to know if that was telling the truth or not, but this is where they were at. They were filled with fear. They sent this note, and, and Joseph starts to cry, and his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph and said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said, don't be afraid of me. Am I in the place of God? That these, these brothers were fearing because of their consciences, right? They, they knew what they had done was wrong. They weren't afraid because of Joseph's behavior. They were afraid because of their own behavior and being retaliated against. So Joseph says to them, this, this is one of my favorite passages in, in Scripture, is you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, right? Your intent in this whole thing was to get rid of me, but God had a plan, and that plan was for good, and it was to accomplish what is now being done, right? The, the providence of God, and it was the saving of many lives. And so then don't be afraid. I will provide for you. I'll provide for your children. And he reassured them, and he spoke kindly to them. And finally, there's peace in this family, this family of deceit and lying and dishonesty. And uh, finally, they are coming together in peace. And that response of Joseph to his brothers, it reveals his attitude, uh, not just towards them, but towards God. He's humbling himself under the authority of God. He's regarding God as sovereign over him the one who had providently provided uh, all throughout his life. He knew what God's purpose was for his life, for his family, uh, for the all the families. <clears throat> and he behaved with tender compassion towards his brothers. Now, it's interesting in this uh, verse um, where he, you know, he's kind of proving to be his brother's keepers. And if you remember way back in Genesis chapter 4, uh, when Cain killed Abel and God asked, where is your brother? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Here, Joseph is saying, I am my brother's keepers. Genesis opens with Adam and Eve trying to become like God. Genesis closes with Joseph denying that he is in God's place. And, and what this teaches is that the, the consequences of deception uh, that caused this family so much trouble, it's finally coming to an end when Joseph uh, chooses not to take revenge over his brothers. And so now we come to the conclusion of this chapter in verses 22 through 26 uh, and, and the death of Joseph. And so Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all of his father's family and he lived to be 110 years, and he saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, and also the children of Mekur, son of Manasseh. Uh, and they were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. And, and we talked about that with the blessing that Jacob gave to Ephraim and Manasseh uh, when they were placed on his knees. So we're seeing this continuation. God, uh, Joseph has lived long enough now to see God's blessing on him, on his children, on his children's children, and, and so on. And so he says to his brothers, Now I am about to die soon. I'm going to die, but God will surely come to your aid. 
And God will take you up out of this land to the promised land, to the land that he had promised. This oath made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just kind of make note of that for a second. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and say, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And so Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. This took place 54 years after Jacob's death. Joseph uh, lived another 54 years after Jacob's death and then passed away when he was 110. That's kind of significant because there are many Egyptian texts that refer to the number 110 as being the perfect lifespan, the ideal lifespan. And so Abraham lived to be 175, Isaac 180, Jacob 147, Joseph 110. And, and he was put in a, a coffin. He probably could have been given a burial in a pyramid. This was the second in command in Egypt. Or he could have had some other kind of grand burial in Egypt. We saw what happened with Jacob. He, he could have had ten times more that. But he wanted his body embalmed, uh, mummified, placed in a coffin in Egypt. And then eventually he says, I, when you return to the promised land, I want you to carry my bones back to that land. Joseph was choosing the promises of God over the privileges of the world. And we'll see later on during the Exodus that the descendants here would take his bones and bury them in the promised land near Shechem. They, they would do so in this parcel of land that Jacob had bought um, and given to him and uh, perhaps this would have been done near Abraham's oak, which we saw in chapter 48, verse 22. This is a grand expression of Joseph's faith in God and God's promises to his forefathers. And, it, and it, all of this provides this fitting climax to the book of Genesis and, and even the formative period of Israel as a nation. Joseph says God will surely take care of you and will bring you up from this land to the land which he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that verse 24 is the first reference to these three patriarchs together in Scripture. The, 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 the outstanding feature of Joseph's life here was his faithful loyalty to God regardless of whatever circumstances were taking place. And this story of Joseph, this account of Joseph, shows us that the, the road to uh, significance, the road to um, authority, it comes through being humble, comes through being a humble servant. And so we've made it through this book of Genesis, and um, I pray that this has been a, a blessing for you. One, one of the many great revelations uh, of God in Genesis, perhaps um, the biggest one of all, has been his faithfulness, the, the faithfulness of God. And um, we, we see that. We've seen it all throughout these stories. Um, almost every section of this book demonstrates the fact that God is absolutely trustworthy, that we can rely on his word, his spoken word, and his written word, and we can do so with confidence. All the major characters of Genesis came to acknowledge the faithfulness of God. Even Jacob, who was perhaps the most skeptical, came to have this firm trust in God as God guided him throughout his life. In the beginning, we, we saw that humanity was created in the image of God. So as being the bearers of God's image, we have this relationship with our creator and we have relationship with one another, and we have relationship with all the, the creatures, the creations of the earth. The image of God in us consists of God's spiritual qualities that distinguish him from anything else. Now, the fall obscured this, but it didn't eliminate it. Uh, the, the fall damaged 
our relationship with God, but it didn't eliminate it. God has a plan for us, and, and God is faithful to his promises. And as we trust in God, we experience his blessing, and we become his instruments that through us, God can bring blessings upon blessings to others. So I thank you for being here with me tonight. I thank you for being part of these last 10 weeks. Congratulations, you've made it through the first book of the Bible. Uh, We're going to break next week, so no study next week as we come into Thanksgiving week. Uh, But we will resume on the 28th of November as we begin our next book, the book of Exodus. We'll look at chapter 1. So I invite you to read ahead or go back. Go back and uh, reread through Genesis. You have some time to do that. Go back in these studies. And, um, you know, we can always glean something new out of God's word. We don't have to just read it once and then be done and move on. So uh, I I hope that this has been a help. I thank you for being with me. And before we close, I'd like to offer up a prayer. So I want you to pray with me. And Lord, we thank you for these last 10 weeks. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for this gift of technology that allows us to study together. We thank you for your word, Lord. That, that speaks to us yet today, not some ancient text thousands of years old, but that your word is alive, that it speaks to us. And so continue to guide us, Lord, give us wisdom, help us to stay on the path. And, and as we come into this week of Thanksgiving, Father, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with, all that you continue to bless us with, and all that you have in store for us. It's in Jesus' name that we give thanks and pray. Amen. Friends, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful weekend. If I don't see you before, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I look forward to starting this study back up uh, a week from Monday in the book of Exodus. It's going to be an exciting study, 40 chapters long. And uh, after that, we will continue on uh, into the book of Leviticus. So thank you again. And I pray you have a wonderful evening. Stay safe. Stay healthy, stay warm, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.